and welcome to episode 37 of the Great Canadian Hockey Podcast. On behalf of myself, James Percy, and my co-host Aiden Sarah, we welcome you, all of our all of our dedicated and loyal listeners that we love so much. And that co-host of mine, how are we doing, Aiden? What's going on? Well, we're recording this on a Saturday. You're hearing it on a Sunday. Um, I, this is a work day for me, so this is kind of in between and around a game later. Black Falls plays Olds at four. We beat Brooks on Tuesday, which was cool, but the fact there was a Tuesday game and now a Saturday game means that I've had pretty much two evenings all week that have been free and that's it. And I'm getting I'm getting tired. <laughs> I feel like being sleepy, especially this time of year, will become a, a theme on this podcast. I myself have been a a little more tired even on nights that I'm not doing anything. And I, I mean, I work most evenings, but, you know, this time of year it gets you. You just get a little more cozy and uh, it's a lot easier to, I don't know, get a grilled cheese sandwich and some soup going and uh, catch a movie and just, just chill. Just be all sleepy and cozy. Dude, I saw Killers of the Flower Moon last night, finally. That was one of the evenings i had off was yesterday night and i loved it it was very good we'll get to it i'm sure when we finish off with our weekly movies because i'll yeah i'll yeah. talk more about it but it was like it was a strong very strong 8.5 out of 10 maybe a week 9 out of 10 but it was right mm. up there mm. and is that on a normal person scale or my scale of 10 is absolute unattainable perfection i think i have one movie maybe no i have two movies all time 10 out of 10 so it's 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 at a pretty scrutiny there's a lot of scrutiny on that rating okay okay all right i can get on board with that that's cool well we have an obscene amount of hockey to get to um i feel like we gotta start this off in ottawa because there is a lot going on there um i feel like ottawa has kind of dominated the hockey news aiden where do we want to take things first with the senators well, we haven't even talked about Pinto, really. Like, we talked about the Pinto rumors, but because of our weeks, respectively, it's been kind of hard to do a podcast since he got suspended. So Shane Pinto gets 41 games. What have you heard about the reports, James? Because my understanding of everything I heard was that he gave his legal account to somebody else, and that was the rule that was violated. Do you so have I've heard sense? that. Yeah, I've heard that, and I heard it was the primary issue among other betting things. And his account has his account slash accounts have been tracked for a little while now. Okay, and, interesting. And yeah, um, I mean, you wonder how much of this at this point is like, I mean, hearsay, pretty much, because like it's it's rumors, 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 reports, reports, reports. Like, I don't know if we're going to have a full proper report uh, on the investigation from the NHL. I don't I, I know that there's uh, isn't there like a publication ban on part of what happened? Yes. OK, so, yeah, with the publication ban, we're not we're not going to get all the details. So a lot of it's just going to be rumors and reports. But, yeah, um, what I had heard was that was the primary reason that he had gives given someone else his login info. And as someone who bets themselves, um, I, one reason that someone would do that is I went to Ottawa for a music festival last summer and I wanted to bet on the cup finals and bet 365 wouldn't let me bet in Ontario because they have different sportsbook apps that are allowed there so i mean he was probably out of town playing and he got someone else assigned to his account supposedly it was someone in long island gambling is legal there but it would have been a different sports book or something along those lines and uh yeah he was i mean to put it simple i think he was made an example of because there's a lot of criticism uh given to the nhl for how hard they advertise sports betting and I mean, they are realistically just getting with the times every other sports doing it, but they pump it pretty hard. And uh, a lot of people don't like that. So I think the NHL just went, hey, look, we're not OK with all of it. We're just making money. So we are going to get, throw you a bone and say, here's Shane Pinto in trouble. That's what I got from it. Is that what you got from it as well? 
Yeah, I really, really think it's hypocritical that Shane Pinto got suspended as long as he did from a team that he has to wear a bet 99 sponsorship on his helmet when he goes to play. Right. Like I understand. Yeah. He broke the rules and you're right about the example thing. Like it's, it's the NHL saying, this is how strictly we're going to punish even, you know, potentially not super severe violations of the betting policy. Because, you know, when you hear uh, a, a professional athlete get in trouble for gambling, your first thought goes to, oh, was he gambling on his own games, right? And that was so, so far from what happened. But um, overall, James, that honestly is like so far on the Ottawa Senators' back burner right now, right? Like, Well, well, well wait, Aiden, it's not just that he wasn't betting on his own games. He wasn't betting on hockey. Yeah, that that too, right? Like, and, and it's... You know, we saw an NFL player this year get suspended six games because he placed a legal bet that wouldn't have violated any rules, but he did it on team property and he got suspended six games. And that's the NFL, which has a 16 game regular season. So that's a lot higher a percentage than six games in the NHL would be like it's, you know, there's there's going to have to be we're in this gray area right now, James, there has to be way, way better define black and white rules and i think that's going to come in the summer the nhl has to address that they have no choice well listening to listening to the 32 thoughts podcast there was supposedly a meeting uh that, that players were able to attend or or like a kind of like an info seminar about don't do this don't do this don't do this from what i heard there wasn't much of a do this it was only the don'ts not the do's so that that part for me was a little bit odd but um, one of them, uh, that they were talking about was don't joke about gambling over texts or conversations with your friends. So it honestly feels like the NHL is trying to bring the hammer down really hard and it feels like very unnecessarily. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I, I get the concept of just put a, huge wall in front of this before it gets to a point where it's out of control but you're right that it's it's we're taking it to a huge extreme speaking of huge extremes james um listen i know i might be beating a dead horse with this and maybe the two things aren't related but what did the chicago blackhawks get punished for um for their their sexual assault cover-up of the kyle beach situation last year not much no, it was a cash fine. Please explain to me how Ottawa failing to disclose a no trade clause in a trade is worth losing a first round draft pick. That is a big, big value piece for any team. And because of the Evgeny Dadanov trade, if you don't remember, the Ottawa Senators traded Evgeny Dadanov to the Vegas Golden Knights. Dadanov had a 10 team no trade list that Ottawa failed to disclose to Vegas. Vegas tried to trade Dadanov to Anaheim. Anaheim was on his no trade list. Vegas didn't know that the trade was voided and the Ottawa senators for failing to disclose it to Vegas in the initial trade were docked a first round draft pick. And James, like maybe I'm not saying that Ottawa. No, I am saying that Ottawa shouldn't have gotten docked a first round draft pick, even putting aside the, the Chicago Blackhawks of it, which is makes it even worse. I still think that's way too harsh of a punishment. Like you, you, you slipped, right? Pierre Dorian slipped. I don't think it was done with malice because at the end of the day, a Ted team, no trade list wouldn't have been the, the be all end all in that trade between Ottawa and Vegas. Like I refuse to believe that that would have significantly impacted the trade. And he left out that information to put, push the trade through easier. I actually just think it was a mistake and you're punishing a new ownership group on all new senators team because of a mistake like that in such a severe way i really i don't like it man i don't like it at all what do you think not to mention you just suspended one one of their key players for 41 games like yeah no um i do put the chicago situation aside because i do think in in the two two and a half years it's been i think we have a different nhl i think we have an nhl that is more trigger happy in reacting to things i think we have an nhl that is more um tries to be more bold with its decisions it makes and wants to show everyone that it is 
And I think part of that is because of the Chicago Kyle Beach situation. I think they want to show that when something happens, they they bring action and action is swift. I think that's something that they want to show now. Um, so I don't really factor the Chicago situation in. I know everyone is. I know everyone does. But um, I I just think it was different in NHL. I, I think it's a lot, a lot has changed in, in the last couple of years. But, um, yeah, no, take a small fine. Take a third round pick. Uh, suspend suspend a, a person in management. I don't know. Like, a first round pick. No, not even slightly. No, I don't like it at all. I don't even like it even slightly. Um, and speaking of suspending someone in management, um, good luck picking who because Pierre Dorian has been fired. Ottawa said it was GM Pierre, Pierre Dorian who had been there for what was it? A, a nearly a decade. If I'm an NHL team who's thinking about letting go of my general manager, especially if I'm an NHL team that needs to think about retooling or rebuilding, I am gunning at Pierre Dorian. James, like significant mistakes with the Ottawa Senators in that time frame. I can think of one. It was the Matt Duchesne is what he gave up for Matt Duchesne. And then he made up for it by what he got for Eric Carlson. <laughs> like, I really, truly believe he did an excellent job in Ottawa. A lot of the high draft picks, I really, really did not like him picking Sanderson over Drysdale when he did, and that looks like a slam dunk. The decision to pick Kachuk over Byram was bold at the time as well, and as good as Byram is, that looks like it's worked out very well. The contract for Brady Kachuk didn't look like it was going to get done as easily as it did when they went into the season. It looked like Kachuk might hold out significantly. Dorian got it done. That Chikrin trade was awesome. Giving up what he gave up for Chikrin. The Alex Dabrinka trade, in hindsight, wasn't good. But any anybody with half a brain in hockey would have made that trade at that time if you were in Pierre Dorian shoes. You would have. And he recovered fine. Yeah, and, and you give up Korchinski, which really hurts because he looks like a stud in Chicago. But realistically, it was a seventh overall pick. So again, there's always that would they have picked Korchinski aspect of it. Probably not. Um, Maybe, yeah, we'll see. Um, but Ann Lauer, like Dorian wasn't Ann Lauer's guy. And I kind of think Dorian unfortunately got a little bit of Ann Lauer wanting to get his guy in there, who was Steve Steos, and he saw the opportunity to <laughs> let go of Dorian without much controversy because he can just say, I took this this team over and we have a player who gets suspended for 41 games and we have a first round draft pick forfeited it's time to let go of the gm but i i have to say pierre dorian i think got <laughs> it, for lack of a better term i think he got done a little dirty man like i i really like what he's done with ottawa and i think a lot of nhl teams should be lining up to talk to him well just remember you're only as good as your last deal and in Pierre Dorian's last deal, he traded the rights to Jakob Novak to Montreal for future considerations. So we'll we'll see how that one ages. NHL legend future considerations. I want to see a banner. Made, he's made an obscene amount of future considerations trades. There's like seven of them in the past couple of years. Like he is flying at future considerations. Uh, one quick question. Did he... Was he the one that traded Zibanejad to the Rangers for Broussard? Did he do that? He either, that was either like one of the first things he did or one of the last things the previous regime had done. Because I'm on cap friendly ripping through his trades and there's so many that it's taken me a really long time to get there. Yeah, if that's one of his trades, I think on the last podcast, I called that the worst trade of all oh, time. Yeah, yeah, was he, that did, him? That. he yeah. did do that. Okay, well... There's his big slip, I guess, but... But he also managed to get Tommy Wingles for Buddy Robinson and Zach Stortini. Does that balance it out? I don't think so, but <laughs> thanks, James. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, okay, here's one more. Uh, he. This is the last one, because we could go on this forever. He, um, for uh, a Curtis Lazar who was flaming out, he managed to get Yerky Yoki Paka in a second-round pick. 
that is a very good deal. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. So. Well, let's move on from the Sens. I feel bad for Ottawa. I like that team. They deserve better. Wait, wait, wait. What about Ann Lauer? What about his comments? Um. That was interesting. I bet you somebody he is going to get in his ear and kind of say, hey, that's not really how owners talk to the media. But I want them to talk like that. I know, but it's just, <laughs> you, you, know that, you know that that is the only time you're going to see that guy be that blunt, right? And for better or for worse. Yeah, he he basically, I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically said, I didn't, I didn't sign up for this. Like, this wasn't my problem. I didn't know about this. Well, I kind of think about, it's a joke in Friends. Have you seen Friends? Uh, I've actually been watching Friends going to sleep. So I fall asleep to two episodes and I wake up to another one like like a season later. That's valid. Well, yeah. the the now late Matthew Perry, R.I.P., has a oh, joke love in that Friends. Guy. Yeah, he's a beauty. Has a joke in Friends where Monica and Ross are yelling at each other about something. And it was after him and Monica got married and he goes, what did I marry into? And it was quite funny for the moment based on what they were saying. And that's kind of the that's kind of the vibe I got from Ann Lauer's comments. Like, what did I what did I inherit here? Like this is his first year on the job. He's months in to being the owner of the senators. And like I can't think of a more strenuous three weeks in a hockey team that didn't like that wasn't the Chicago Blackhawks because of what they did, right? Like, um, Anyways, a couple weeks ago now, last weekend. Yeah, it was last weekend, last Sunday, not that long ago. I went to the Heritage Classic. It was really cool. Way better than I thought it was going to be. Outdoor games, I always kind of in the back of my head were like, oh, I'm going to, I'll go to one one day, but I don't have high expectations. And then when I got the tickets, I was excited, but I still didn't have very high expectations. Even sitting in the upper bowl of Commonwealth Stadium, the vantage point is better than I thought it was going to be. I expected to like see little dots skating around. It's like you're like, you're watching a hockey game, right? Like it's, that's awesome. It's, it was really cool. Um, the The biggest takeaway I had, other than the fact that it was a really good bucket list experience and me and my buddy Cam had a good time, is Calgary's awful. Like, it's an outdoor game, man. Players love this. Even if it's maybe a little bit played out, even, like, the players love playing in outdoor games. One player, two players on the Calgary Flames look like they wanted to be there. There was no drive. There was no extra gear for anybody. Matt Coronado and Mackenzie Weger were the only two guys that I saw that looked like they were remotely engaged in what was happening. They were the only two guys that I saw that I was like, you know what? They would play on the Vegas Golden Knights or the Colorado Avalanche. Everybody else looked like AHLers. It was terrible. And the Oilers have a bad record, but at least to their credit, they look <laughs> they look determined. They look like they they look like they care about what they're doing. Like and man, it was, I was so, so disappointed. I was in shock at times during that game. The way the game started, I thought we might be seeing a nine nothing game and then Edmonton took their foot off the gas a little bit, but man, Calgary, Calgary, there are some teams that are worse than their records. There are some teams that are better than their records. Even with two wins on the year, Calgary might be better than their record or Calgary's record might be better than how they're playing. Like they're, they're bad. Well, there is good news on that front because um, Calgary has Elias Lindholm, Noah Hannafin, Chris Tanev, Nikita Zadorov, all as pending UFAs. Show me some chaos. Let them keep playing terrible. Dude, give, me, they, give me some action. They unequivocally need to start a rebuild. Period. Yeah. It's not even like... I will not entertain anything to the contrary. Like it, it, this team ceiling isn't even the playoffs, man. It is 10th in the West. And you can either keep trying to break through the 10th in the West ceiling, or you can call it, you can flip these guys while they still have any sort of remote trade value. And you can start from the bottom up. And maybe in four years, you're, you're better for it, right? And and I know that's always my attitude with teams that aren't contenders is the best thing you could do is, is start building from the bottom. But I didn't see a single redeeming thing in the Calgary flames in the last few times I've watched them. 
I mean, and it gets even worse because Markstrom signed till he's 36. Uyghur and Huberto and Kadri signed into oblivion. And I mean, like, realistically, the only great contract on that team is probably Rasmus Anderson. Like, I don't know where this all of this value is coming from outside these UFAs. It's going to be a tough, long one, and they just have to get to it. Oh, Oliver Shillington, also pending UFA. Yeah, it doesn't get better. doesn't get any better at all. But yeah, that's that's Calgary. I'm glad you had a good time out there. Was it cold? It was. Um, I always don't dress warm enough because I'm a little bit cocky about my. Dude, you wear shorts in the winter. You're crazy. Yeah, like well, and <laughs> it's just the 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 very very long hours I've spent in a hockey rink. That's just my climate. Right, is cold. But sitting there and doing nothing, it was it was my hands. I needed gloves and I didn't bring gloves. That was my mistake. I'll own that. Okay, we talked on the last podcast that the NHL was talking to decentralize the draft. We said it was terrible. They voted to decentralize the draft. And I, again, it feels like a lot's happened. If nothing had happened, I'd still be really, really upset about this. Um, But every time I think about it, I get really, really upset about it. Like this, this sucks. I'm like, it's, and I know there's so many hockey fans that just do not give a crap about the draft. I know there's so many hockey fans that, their attitude is I'll care about them when they're in the NHL or I'll care about them when they're on my team, but junior hockey, NCAA hockey, these kids, the world juniors, the draft, it is, it is hockey at its purest form in terms of the money hasn't hit them yet. Right. This is, this is passion. This is love of the game. This is such a big moment in their lives. It's a stepping stone in their careers. And the draft was always a celebration and an acknowledgement of how important it was for everybody involved. And I loved it and it hurts my heart. I did some reading further into it. Are, are they not saying that, um, I, I swear I saw that the players are still going. It's just not team staff that are going now. There's a lot of balls in the air because there was a quite a bit of negative backlash among everybody that wasn't team staff. The big thing is that, yeah, the team staffs aren't going to go. Um, yeah, just, just send a GM and, and a franchise spokesperson, I guess. Yeah, I, and you know what? That would be okay. But another another thing, another pitch was just to just the high-end picks, right? Like, but that's so unfair. I know. And, and that's kind of what I mean is, like, at the end of the day, you have guys, you have guys that show up that know they're probably not going to get drafted and then – they're there as somebody takes a chance on them in the 160 spot, right? Like yeah. that happens and it's, it's cool and it's great for those players. And yeah. So and their I really, families and their friends. Yes, yeah. Um, and like all of the people, like, like go back to that Paul Maurice quote from earlier this year, about how this game, this first game is about you, but it's not about you. It's about all the people that got you there. It's about all the people that raised you and, and brought you along the way. The draft is like that too. The draft is exactly like that. Look at what Alex Newhook got drafted. His whole family was there. And then all his buddies from junior were there. He walked out of the out of the draft floor and he's got 16 of his best friends swarming him. I don't want to miss any of that. I want all of that around forever. That is hockey. That is hockey at its finest. I almost just swore there I feel so passionate about this. We're still attempting to keep this podcast clean. I don't want to add the explicit tag yet. So... Yeah, uh, I I I don't want only high end picks. What's gonna happen when uh, when Arizona goes off the board and takes Daniil Boot, and then so he's not there, but then you got four people after him that are there. What a joke! That sounds stupid. Then where do all the player interviews go? What are the media people gonna do? Well, and that was that was something Elliot Friedman talked about. The draft is a very, very good place for new media people. And me and James would probably end up being included in that right now. Like, that's a great place for us to go and meet people, right? If it's in Vancouver, if it's in Edmonton, that's that's an event that we get into. And, and you know, it's 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 networking and it's 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 exposure and like going to the draft, going to the draft, honestly. 
I would be it would be more of like a, a surreal experience. Like I would choose if you gave me two choices, do you want to go to the draft and cover it for the podcast? Or do you want to go sit in an NHL press box and cover that game for the podcast? I think I'm going to the draft, dude. Honestly, I don't even, I it's not, too. it's a no brainer. And like, maybe I'm speaking from the benefit of like, you know, I know what it's like to just sit in a press box at a game. You know, I sit there with Ian, who's a friend. He's the red deer advocate guy for the rebels games. Um, we chat it's fun but realistically you're just kind of sitting there right where the draft like you talk to people there's things happening there's there's conversations there's there's introductions to be made there's socializing to do there's talking to the players you have access to those players right like and and man I really really hope that the draft maintains all of that and that the decentralization aspect of it will affect the big groups of teams and that's it but it doesn't sound like that's all it's going to affect hopefully it's just not too extreme of a of a dismantling of the event yeah i think that's uh that's about all we got on that one i think uh there's so much to say but we would honestly be repeating ourselves if we kept going i think right now it's just a wait and see game i think right now i mean other than that let's take a look at early season starts what teams are impressing you what teams are disappointing you what do we got well, I know it's on the rundown later, but let's go Canucks to start. <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. Like, because I'm seeing, and I think this is pretty, I think I think this is premature as hell if you're talking like, like look at that defense and tell me that's a cup contender because it's a good playoff team because of the forwards, but you're not winning a Stanley Cup with that defense core right now. That's my personal opinion. Um, but I'm seeing them at times on top of, and at times very high up in like Stanley cup odds lists right now. Oh, that, yeah. seems, that seems premature. Um, yep. I don't, I, I don't really like, I, I that, that's about as Vancouver as it gets of the overreactions when the Canucks are good. It's like, they're going to win the Stanley cup. They're not going to win the Stanley cup. There's six or seven teams in the NHL that I think would beat them in six games or less in a playoff series, but it's been awesome. They beat the sharks 10 one, which man, San Jose, we'll, we'll talk about their start too. And like <laughs> right after, um, but the one thing I want to say about the Canucks is the talent was always there. The production was there last year, right? Patterson had over a hundred points. Miller had another point per game season. Kuzmenko was one shy of 40 goals. The thing that I love, the thing that I'm the happiest with is when you watch the Canucks play every single time a line is on the ice, a defense pairing is on the ice. You can tell that the players wearing Canucks jerseys want the puck more than the other team. The determination, the speed of the game, the off puck effort. That was Tanner Pearson drove me insane last year. Brock Besser drove me insane last year because of the coasting off the puck and the lack of a forecheck and the lack of a back check and the lack of interest in what they were doing. And that has completely turned around this year. You have effort up and down the lineup. Everybody is putting in their shift. Everybody is doing what they need to do on both ends of the puck. And I love it. Yeah. I mean, as a Canucks fan, I can't really see much not to love right now. Um, I saw... Social media going crazy about their goal differential. I mean, it is a little bit inflated right now, but it, it's it's a pretty damn good goal differential. Um, like they're 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 hitting it pretty hard. Uh, that power play is ruthless. That power play is disgusting, man, and it's so annoying having one guy in my hockey pool who's right behind me having every player on the Canucks power play because when they score, it's just bang 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 right up the leaderboards. I'm still in first, but I'm holding on by a thread, buddy. Holding on by a thread. I I don't like it. I want that Canucks power play to flop for a couple of weeks, just for my sake. Um, but yeah, it's it's exciting to watch, and you know you can you can feel people in the city really enjoying themselves more, and working in a building where um some of my colleagues' job is to talk about the Canucks, you feel the positivity more. You really do. And that's nice. I'm enjoying that. But I mean, if you want to take it to the Sharks, not pretty. 
I'll finish off of Vancouver with one more thing. Quinn Hughes looks like the front runner to win the Norris Trophy right now. I think Philip Peronic deserves a tremendous amount of credit in that. He's been awesome as a partner. He's been giving Quinn the freedom he needs to succeed. Chris Tanev did that for Quinn Hughes in his rookie year. And as much as the whole trade talk is about finding a partner for Quinn, I actually think finding somebody on the second pair for Carson Soucy is probably the priority. Keep Peronic and Hughes. It's working. Yeah, the San Jose Sharks. Yeah, they lost 10-1 to the Canucks. Aside from that game, it's, uh, you know, they haven't lost every game 10-1, but the rest of them haven't been much better. <laughs> they are now 0-9-1 through 10 games. They have scored 10 goals. They have a single point. Their leading goal scorer is Fabian Zetterland with three. Their leading point scorer is Tomasz Hurdle with five. Those two are the only two players with more than two points in 10 games. However, with all that being said, James, if this Macklin Celebrini, Michael Misa, Gavin McKenna for the next three years, I believe that if the San Jose Sharks, which they're not, are not going to make the playoffs, this, at the end of the day, this is what, this isn't a bad thing for them, right? Like I know an 0-9-1 start with awful hockey and nobody playing well. Yeah, like it, it's, it looks terrible, but this is what rebuilding teams almost need to go through. This is the best chance of rebuilding into a contender, into a strong team. The Pittsburgh Penguins pre-2003 were terrible. And then guess what happened? Flurry, Malkin, Crosby in a row. And then Jordan Stahl a couple years later. And then what happened? They won a Stanley Cup and then they won two more, right? Tampa Bay before Stamkos was like this. Washington before Ovechkin was like this. Like it, it, it. And I guarantee you, you ask a Capitals fan, would you have taken being awful and then winning the Stanley Cup in 2018 instead of barely making the playoffs every year and never winning a cup? They would take the cup and then being awful. Everybody would. So as bad as they are, I feel obliged to say that this is this is what needs to happen for San Jose. And it's it's terrible because of how bad they're playing. But in the grand scheme of things, this is a good thing. Totally, totally. And uh, I don't know why. I just have a feeling. But I feel that Cole Iserman will be a San Jose Shark. They kind of need a defenseman at this point, but there's no, like, like the top three picks are not going to be defensemen. They're just not like as good as the best player available at this stage of the game. Yes. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Well, and I like Eklund. He's only got two points through 10 games, but again, the team is just so terrible. It's hard to pin that on him. Um, But Eklund defenseman, when you have Henry (laughs) Thrun, they got Henry. He's back in the AHL, man. I know, I know. You know why he's back in the AHL? So that he doesn't have nine goals getting scored on his team while he's on the ice. Well, Coronado went down for the Flames too, and I like he was playing well. That was only done because, um, because they just needed to get him out of a negative environment. I think, right? Yeah. Look, dude, it's not pretty up here. Let's send you back down and have some fun. Okay, so I'm gonna shift the topic of discussion from teams to players okay so we're gonna start on the negative side of things (laughs) james i'm going to give you a player's name and i want you to tell me and you might know some of these you can just answer it correctly i want you to tell me how many points you think they have this is players with poor starts anthony duclair has played 10 games how many points do you think he has for the san jose sharks one one goal, that's it. <laughs> this is a guy who two years ago put up 31 in Florida. I thought he was a good pick in fantasy when one of my friends took him. Yeah, like, well, power play one, first line minutes, right? But the team's so bad. Uh, I know you're going to know this one. Jonathan Drouin, eight games with the Colorado Avalanche, hyped up as the Halifax Mooseheads connection with Nathan McKinnon. How's that going? How many one points? One point. One assist, that's it. Yeah, Um. and it really sucks because dude looked absolutely dangerous in the first couple games of the year. And then he lost that role. I don't know why. I was really hoping for a sophomore boom from Juraj Slykovsky. However, in 10 games, how many points do you think he has? I think he has zero, right? He has one. Okay, one. Just one assist in 10 games. It is. Have you seen all of the write-ups on social media about him? I have not. 
and one, you can one came me. from Jordan Schmaltz, who played with him in Europe, who played against him in Europe. And he said the guy plays like he has horse blinders on and is built like a, uh, and I quote, built like a Ford F-350 at 16 years old, but doesn't have the hockey sense to uh, to pair with the raw talent and build. You need a little bit of everything to be a superstar. And yeah, if you, the hockey sense might be the most important thing. And yeah, if Psychovsky's lacking that, then. Yeah. I hope he turns it around. I don't want to, I, I hate kids getting the bus tag thrown at them, but it's not looking pretty. You see no. one bad one every 10 years. Uh, last decade, we had Yakupov. I really hope Slav isn't that. Yeah, well, and and Logan Cooley looking as good as he did both last year and to start this year. Like, I, there was big expectations on him going into Arizona. He kind of just now scored his first goal, but he's still at eight points in 10 games. Seven of them are assists, but I think he's looked good. Um, okay, Trevor Zegras, 10 games. What's the stat line? Uh, He has five points? He has two. He has two, okay. One goal and one assist. He got benched a couple weeks ago because of, and I quote, zero defensive effort, which, James, there are some I things. I know, I know. There are you some things ring the bell again. that are just so vindicating to see when I've been, like, it feels like I was the only one who was just like, this guy's actually bad at the whole game of hockey. And it feels really good to see that uh, corroborated by his head coach at this point. Um, because yeah, you can't be, you can't be an NHL superstar making, uh, big money. If you're only going to play 15% of the game of hockey. Well, I'm putting a vice on you. You're only allowed to, to dunk on Trevor Zegers, defensive ability three more times this season. Use them wisely because we can't okay. let this be the Trevor Zegers hate podcast. That's not okay. We can't do it. Sure. Okay. And Starting this, now. This time it was warranted. Yeah. But from here on out, you only get three more this season. Okay, deal. Um, Blake Wheeler, New York Rangers, 37 years old. He had 55 points in 72 games last year. Following up a 60 point in 65 game season. Pretty respectable. 10 games for the Rangers. How many points for Blake Wheeler? He has one. He has zero. He's yet I, to record a point. I thought he I thought he got a point against Winnipeg. Did they rescind that? Yeah, I think it was changed. Oh. But there was a point. Yeah, he was on the ice, and I just think like the they fixed the scoring. Like he either didn't touch the puck out. Of the it, oh, it was a phantom assist. Yeah, it was one of those. Oh, um, yeah, nice. They, they Love happen. those. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think the fact it was a one year contract looks even better now for the New York Rangers. It looked pretty good before because it's like, oh, yeah, depth player. Why not? Um, I think the silver lining is that Philip Hedl, six points in 10 games to start. Alexi Lafreniere, four goals in 10 games to start. Not bad at all. Like Hedl got goals. hurt. Hedl got hurt. That sucks. Fox got hurt. That hurts more. Um, but the Rangers look dangerous, man. They look like a great team. And I've, I, I, again, I love Panarin. I pick him in fantasy every year. And he's got 16 points in 10 games for me already. His jersey's on my wall at work. <laughs> the, I, I, chopping the hair is working for him. It is. Yeah, it looks a little bit weird. Okay, St. Louis Blues, Jordan Cairo, 25 years old, last season, 37 goals and 73 points in 79 games. How has he started through nine games? Well, I have him in fantasy, and he's been a raging disappointment, especially considering I have a keeper league, and I kept him. Um, he has two points. Three now, but... Three. Oh, he has three now. Wonder yeah, well, goal, two assists, three points. It is... Yeah, it's... it's... Even the, these are depressing. Are any of them positive? Uh, we'll get to some positive ones, but I have four more negative ones here. Oh, great. Um, Braden Shen, St. Louis Blues, nine games. I think I haven't seen him on the score sheet. Does he have one? One assist. Yeah. Here's a couple. There's three very interesting ones now. And the third guy, I want to segue into talking about him before we get to the positives. Matty Beneers, Calder Trophy winner last season. Sophomore slumps happen, 11 games. How many goals and assists for Matty Beneers? I think he has one point. He is yet to score, but he doesn't have three assists. Oh, he has three assists. For the Seattle okay. Kraken. Um, my beef with him, from what I saw before he made the NHL, was I saw a player that could show flashes of absolute brilliance, 
but I didn't have a lot of faith could bring it every night. And it's, again, sophomore slumps happen. They do, especially for somebody like Beneers who highlighted a surprise team because there's no surprise in Seattle anymore, right? Like you're not sneaking up on a team after you beat the Colorado Avalanche in the playoffs. Like that you just, <laughs> you're no longer going to be like, oh, look at this team. I didn't know they were good. <laughs> um, but Beneers... Yeah, I, I I do think he's going to turn it around. He, much like Zegris, and this, that doesn't count, but much like Zegris, he is a player who I think needs to work on the defensive part of his game. I think the whole team defense from Seattle being better last year really helped him a lot. And I know plus minus is an overrated stat. It's overused. It doesn't really mean much, but he's minus 11 in 11 games. Discounting that, it still means a little something in this context. Yeah, I mean, in playoffs last year, his defensive game was solid. It was, for sure. Well, and I think, again, a byproduct of how good Seattle's team defense was, but he just hasn't looked as engaged as he needs to be this year. Yeah, like, he was, the dude was attacking lanes. Yeah. Huh. All right, what else you got? Dawson Mercer. Oh, 27 goals, 56 points in 82 games last year. He's played 10 games this year. How many points? He has two points. He has no points. Oh, yeah. Jack I Hughes. His name. Jack Hughes is sitting at two points a game. Jesper Bratz got 18 and 10. Brat, brat, brat. I have Bratt in fantasy. That's great. That's, That's a good why I'm in first. Yeah. Tyler Toffoli's got seven goals in 10 games. Rookie defenseman Luke Hughes has seven points in 10 games. Even Eric Halla has five goals in nine games. This team is firing on all cylinders. Nico Heischer hasn't been great so far to start this season. Um, but he's Nico Heischer, so even when he's not scoring, he still is very effective, and he's still a great player to have on the ice whenever he's on the ice. Um, but Mercer, man, like I thought, I would pay, I came close to taking him in 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 fantasy this year because I I thought thirty five goal upside for sure, but ten games pointless. That's that's not good. <laughs> no, they're more concerned about Meyer going than Mercer going. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I guess in a win now team that makes sense. And you just paid Meyer all that money. Yeah. So like, okay. it's definitely more of a focus. Recently demoted to the Cleveland Monsters of the AHL, how many points did fifth overall pick Kent Johnson have through eight games with the Columbus Blue Jackets this season? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe he had one assist. He had a goal and two assists, three goal points. Goal and two assists. But his uh, his ice time was terrible. Like he, he, he wasn't playing. He was getting so few minutes every game. And now that he's down to the AHL, I have an interesting thing to bring up. He just switched agents, James. Do you know what two players that his new agent represents and represented when they left Columbus? Pretty notably, Pierre-Luc Dubois and Seth Jones. Is the writing on the wall that Kent Johnson, who I think it is worth pointing out, is a pending restricted free agent, his entry level contract expires after this season. Is the writing on the wall that Port Moody, BC native Kent Johnson is done in Columbus? Because I I'm starting to get that sense. <laughs> you know what they're gonna tell him, right? If he asks for a trade, they're gonna say, "Show me something on the ice so we can actually trade you and get value back." Show me something. You want to move? Show us. You want to stay? Show us. James, I, I haven't watched. I, I, I've watched some Columbus games because I, again, I just, I have such a big, huge passion for how much I love David Juracek. So I've watched Columbus games because I want to watch Juracek. I want to watch Fantilli. Jack Roslevic was playing on the fourth line. So I was kind of curious what was going on. So I watched two games that, Cillin, or that, um, that Johnson played in and he wasn't playing bad when he was on the ice, but he was getting one shift a period. Like you can't, you yeah. can't be you can't play well in that scenario like it's and i really think i really think for him hiring that agent is a good idea because if you know that's not his fault uh, that's what i'm trying to say right like he's not playing 30 minutes a night and just not and playing bad like that's not the case he's playing 6 minutes a night and let me tell you something i've seen it firsthand right i've been around enough hockey teams to know when you're not getting the ice time when you're when you feel like your spot in the lineup's threatened. Some players can't handle that, right? It's 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 a mental strain. I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand. 
I've seen it firsthand how much better players like that play when their spot in the lineup is reaffirmed, when they get that positive reinforcement for their good play. All of a sudden, all those concerns, all those, every time you're on the ice, you're worried about making a mistake. When that goes away, you play better hockey. And I think that's what Ken Johnson needs. Yeah. Anyways, totally. Totally. let's go to some strong starts, James. We talked about Brad and Hughes in between them. In the NHL point leaders is Elias Pettersson, 19 points in 10 games. I talked about Quinn Hughes already, Artemi Panarin already. Larkin and Dabrinkit have cooled off a little bit. You know who I've really loved this year? And I'm going to just turn it straight over to you. You can talk from here. Mikko Rantanen looks like looks like a top 10 player in the league, like without a doubt. Six goals, 14 points in nine games. And every time he's on the ice, like he's on the ice with McKinnon a lot. And before, McKinnon just, he was the only thing I ever saw when McKinnon was on the ice, was Nathan McKinnon. Miko Rantanen is running the show. He is the motor. He's the one behind the wheel now. How happy are you with this winger? I mean, it's been years that it's been like this for me. It's awesome that the rest of the league takes notice now. Um, because even now that they're paying attention, they still can't seem to figure out how to defend him, um, which is great. I mean, the guy is a truck stick on the ice. He is. His nickname is the Moose for a reason. Like he is, he's a big boy, six four, I believe. Um, yeah. Uh, one of the most interesting things about him is when Colorado switches to their second power play unit. Most of the time, he just stays on the ice. His job on the power play isn't a super mobile one. He stays on the right on the half wall and then moves inches closer to the net. And when he takes that shot, when the cross seam hits him. He chokes up the blade of the stick really like he chokes up a stick really close to the blade. And that's how he takes his little one timer shot. It's almost like a scoop. It's really interesting. But yeah, I'm super thrilled with the guy. I have been for years. I'm like I said, I'm just happy that people take notice of him now. Um, He deserved it for a long time. Last year with McKinnon and McCarr going out for extended periods of time. um, He was the guy. I honestly thought he should have got some heart trophy consideration. Obviously he shouldn't have won it. McDavid is McDavid. And he had 150 points last year. Um, Like you're not, you're not going to get that. And I thought Matthew Kachuk's nomination was well-deserved. I thought Sorokin could have got a nom. I thought there were a lot of guys who could have gotten on. I'm just talking some consideration. We all, we see the ballots. I just want to see his name somewhere on the list. Okay, I'll go to two more players with positive starts. One of them is spoiled by the fact that he has his own individual segment on the rundown down a little bit. Um, <laughs> but I want to talk Mo Sider. He, after his rookie year, 50 points in 82 games, he, he didn't take the step forward he should have. I'm not saying that he took a massive step back. He still had a solid second year in Detroit. But a goal and 10 points in 11 games to start, he looked like the dominant defenseman he was supposed to be. Excellent. This guy's going to be in the Norris ballot, if not this year, in the next couple of years. You're going to start seeing him be right up there. Hey, but how many people do we get on this damn Norris ballot? There's so many great young defensemen in the NHL. So yeah. many. Yeah. Like, like, where is he going to... Who is he usurping? Makar, Fox, Hughes, Darlene, Heiskanen. Yossi still exists. This is not a, a ghost. He's still there. I just named six of them. Okay. We, well, we there's a handful more still. Here's 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 the way I see just that kind of thing. I always kind of just look at it in tiers, right? It's hard to rank one after the other in a definitive one, two, three, four, five, right? It's just it's difficult. It's easier to group players into tiers. Right now, I think Fox and Makar, Fox and Makar were my tier one. I would have to now say Quinn Hughes has worked his way in there so far this season. I bet you would. Um, yeah, and I would not have said that at all ever until now, but he's played well enough this year. Um, Show me some playoff action and I'll take it. Yeah. Well, obviously that hasn't happened. Um, Sider is in my tier two now with Heiskanen with probably McAvoy, who we'll talk about in a bit here. Um, well, Dolly in. with Dolly in, Yep. And I think he's, he's going to share that group. Um for the next little while. Roman Yossi right is still around, but his he's got uh, he's got time against him. Okay, lastly, 12 points in the form of five goals and seven assists. That's the start for Anaheim Ducks centerman Mason McTavish. This team 
despite the Zegris start, I really like everybody else. Pavel Mendukov looks excellent. He, right now, he's my number one rookie defenseman. I've been more impressed with what I've seen out of him than Luke Hughes, honestly. I, I say that completely confidently. Mendukov looks phenomenal. Even, like, Leo Carlson, who's kind of weirdly being deployed. Like, he's started, he's only played six games. He has three goals and four points. He started pretty well, but they're kind of using him sparingly. He's looked good. Troy Terry's got five goals in 10 games. Frank Vetrano has nine goals in 10 games. Is that pace going to keep up? No, but Mason McDavish, who's been playing on a line with him all year, has all of the credit in the world for how good Vetrano started. He looks like a two-way beast, man. Mason McTavish looks like a slam dunk future captain for the Ducks. This should be their face of the franchise. He, I think he's the real deal. I think if the next best on best team Canada is 2026, we're looking at him on that team. I'm, I, I loved what I've seen so far. I'm all over this guy. This isn't long from now. I know. I know. But th- th- there's talk that the a World Cup's going to happen before. And, like, that's – I think that's a stretch. Me and uh, me and Cam, when he was here, went through all our, our best on best teams. And he, he crossed my mind. He was not – he did not make the team. But he was, he was on oh, the radar. Oh, he crossed your mind. Yeah. So uh, we'll see uh, if uh, – We'll see if this continues for him because it's been such a good start. And I, I, I love this player. Like he he's yeah. I, I, when they drafted Carlson, I said McTavish and Carlson are going to end up being the one, two punch face of the ducks. And it's taken 10 games in Carlson's first season for both those two players to kind of prove that. Yeah, that's exactly what's going to happen. I mean, there's a lot of rebuild left to go. There is totally, but you know what? Drysdale is still coming, right? He's been stagnated by injuries again this year, two points in two games before he got hurt. But Olin Zellweger, too, he looks unreal in the AHL so far this season after some amazing WHL seasons and world junior performances. Like, the Ducks are coming. They are. I have one last hot start for you. What's up? How many points does Shane Wright have in six games in the AHL? Oh, I just checked this. So this isn't going to be like an amazing guess, but I was looking at this earlier today. I'm pretty sure it's point per game. He's six and six. Yep. Yeah. Damn right he is. That's Listen, this awesome. is a guy. This is a guy that missed a whole year. He missed his entire draft year. He didn't play a game, a single game. He didn't. Okay. So the people calling him a bust. Shut up. <laughs> he was drafted a year and a half ago. Chill out. Like this. This kid is a good hockey player. He'll get this AHL season. He'll be a leading Calder candidate next year. I just hope, 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 James, we see him with the C on in red this Christmas for Team Canada. That's oh, that, that, be that, awesome. I'd yeah. love to see it. That's what I hope more than anything. Okay, we talked about Charlie McAvoy. He got a four-game suspension. I, James, I wanted longer than that. I wanted a lot longer than that. That was terrible. Did you see the hit on Oliver Ekman Larson? Four games is a lo- is a lot of games. As Dude. suspensions go, four games is 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 solid. It was a gross hit, but four games is four games. I know what, I know what the response that I would get if I said this in a, in in a in a group of hockey fans, and the response is you can't read players' minds. But if I am George Peros, I'm looking and I'm thinking, what are you trying to do? And I talked about this last week when we talked about Rasmus Anderson's uh, suspension for the hit on Patrick Lyon. A. What are you trying to do in that situation? Are you trying to make a hockey play? Charlie McAvoy, he's light years late to hit Oliver Ekman Larson. The puck is gone. The puck is in another country by the time he makes contact. He deliberately hits him in the head, clearly. You see him rise his shoulder up close to the point of contact to make sure that the bottom of Ekman Larson's face takes all of the contact. It's borderline charging, even. I probably would not have called it charging because it was an egregious uh, <laughs> violation of so many other penalties. But man, I if you want to talk about making an example to somebody, had we, we can't still be having these headshots. I, that's my two cents. This cannot still be happening in the NHL. Um, and that McAvoy should have been made an example of because that was that was terrible. He was not trying to do anything except for hurt Oliver Ekman Larson. That was kind of what I was thinking. I mean, yeah, fair, fair. I have nothing to say that you didn't say, except I, I, uh, 
I, I think four games is a lot of games. I, I, I honestly don't want the NHL to arrive to a point where we are consistently handing out games of the like eight plus uh, nature unless someone literally rips another player's arm off. Yeah, and and there are times where it's very clear somebody makes a mistake. Somebody is somebody misses on a hit they meant to throw in the last second. McAvoy comes in from the blue line to hit uh, Ekman Larson at the bottom of the circle, and the like. He has that entire course of action to. He could have stopped at any point. It wasn't like it was too late or Ekman Larson shifted suddenly, right? You see that sometimes where. Like even the Mark Shifley hit, which on Jake Evans in the playoffs a couple years ago, which we've talked about quite a bit as like a, an example for this kind of thing. Even that Shifley hit, like, yeah, he's going there to hit Evans hard. But at the end of the day, Jake Evans does wrap the puck around with his head down very suddenly. Shifley probably couldn't have pulled out of that hit by the time he's at the bottom of the circles, right? Like the hit was happening. Um, McAvoy could have not hit Ekman Larson's face and basically until he made contact, the final straw of him raising his shoulder up into the head happened right before the contact. It was a conscious decision. And I think that's where that's where the NHL needs to say, this isn't okay. You can't be doing this to your opponents, to your colleagues, right? Like this is, it's not okay. I, I, I thought four was too few. I thought four was too few in Anderson's case too, to be fair. See, I just don't want to see suspensions that big. Like, like more than four, four is a lot. That's where I stand, but I, I get where you're coming from. All right, and welcome back. Uh, if you're listening, it's been just a brief few seconds, but for us, it's been nine hours. Uh, Aiden, you've been you've been at the rink. I've been at home. I, I actually went and checked out Wreck Beach for the first time. Went for a little walkie poo. Uh, saw a little sunset. It was a n- nice day here, so kind of had to take advantage of it. I don't do that often enough on my days off, so I got out and saw the sun. But tell me what adventure you got up to. What happened? Well, I got to ask, dude, you went to Wreck Beach to see a sunset? That's not usually what you go to Wreck Beach to see. I mean, it's November, and it was a beach in Vancouver I had never been to. Like, I've never been there before. So I kind of wanted to cross off my list and, like, see where it is. I have to say, those stairs are menacing. Yeah, I mean, if there's a time to go to Wreck Beach, it's it's in the cold, which would <laughs> deter the uh, deter the usual sights of which... Maybe you want to see that, but maybe you don't. <laughs> and just to clarify for anyone listening, like that is a beach where people are nude. Like it is uh like people are full on dropping trow, ripping the bikinis off, um, going all out. They are rocking out with their what rhymes with rock out. And uh yeah, yeah, it's it's different uh, from what I've heard. I haven't seen it myself, I've just always been told. Yeah, well, when you say wreck beach, that's the first thing I think of, and I know Technically, we're like a half Vancouver based podcast, but I know our listener base is probably largely British Columbian. So I'd imagine it, I'd imagine the listeners to know what Wreck Beach is. Uh, I'd be yeah. really curious to see if we do have any actual stragglers, like random people who have been picked up. I would love for them to drop in a Spotify or Instagram question next time they're up. That would be very interesting to see if we have some random listeners from elsewhere. Watch them submit a question for the first time, and we just like rip it. It's just like, well, what a dumb thing to say. <laughs> Any stragglers, you know, we want to hear from you. They submit a question. We're like, wow, how stupid are you? It's just a probably wouldn't do question. that. Probably wouldn't do that. <laughs> All right, what do you get up to, fella? How's your day at the rank? It was good. Um, two games in a row here for the Bulldogs. Tuesday was against the Brooks Bandits. Today was against the Olds Grizzlies. Um, very contrasting teams, those two. Brooks are the national champions. They're the most successful AJHL franchise. Olds are Olds are pretty bad. Um, so today was a less than entertaining, at least third period, because it was 10-2 Black Falls through two periods. So I had to just kind of tough it out and try and stay 
somewhat entertaining for the listener. Um, but man, Tuesday, Tuesday is one of the best games of junior A hockey I've ever seen. Black Falls Brooks is their first meeting of the season. First time they've played since their conference final series last year. Uh, winner took first place. Black Folds, Black Folds took a four nothing lead, ten minutes into the game. I was, I always do a really, really, I always try really hard, man. It's I make a very, very conscious effort to be a neutral broadcaster, you know, and it's hard because I work for this team, and I I care about the players, right? I have personal relationships with everybody, and I want those players to succeed. Um, so it's hard to put that aside at times. I think I do a pretty good job at it, um, but not when it's Brooks. I just <laughs> I want them to beat that team so badly. Um, and you could hear when they scored the fourth goal, me like screaming, it's four nothing Black Folds. I'll put it in the podcast. <laughs> um, it's it it's so far from from a neutral perspective. <laughs> I was just yelling. But then James plot twist, halfway through the second period, it's four four. Um then two goals for Loomer to complete his hat trick, six four, empty netter, seven four final for Black Folds. Unreal game. And those two look like the two best teams in the league this year, which you can argue they were for most of the year last year as well. So hopefully uh, another playoff series will happen and last more than four games because Brooks swept us last year. How do you think they actually stack up in a playoff matchup, this game aside? It's hard to say because they're, they've been really successful. They've been winning games, but they didn't they didn't look like a team. They didn't look like a team on Tuesday. They looked like a collection of superstars. So it's hard to say at the end of the season, how they're going to look because they're going to have a whole season. We're only a third into the season. So they're going to have two thirds of the seasons to, to to play together and to mesh. But as of right now, they just look like a collection of very high end players. Whereas Black Folds looks more like the the team. You know what I mean? Think Rangers Jersey in the playoffs last year. <laughs> Rangers was the collection of star players that just didn't click. And Jersey was the team that and ended up beating them. If they played right now, I think that's how it would go. Black Folds would win, you know, in a tight series, but if these Brooks players click, it could be them for sure. Pretty easily. I, I don't think I've asked yet. I don't know if we've talked about it, but who is the uh, Brooks bandit this year that is probably going to end up being an NHLer? Cause there's usually one Logan Sawyer. He's an excellent forward, fantastic stick handling ability, good hockey sense, great shooter. His skating is excellent. His edge work on the rush really stood out to me, the way he can move his feet to manipulate the way his body's moving. He's from Orangeville, Ontario. He's the highest ranked skater in the AJHL going into the draft. Um, 17 years old. He's a first year draft eligible Providence College commit. But production wise, only 19 points in 19 games. He's well off the top of the league. Like Blackfolds have the two current leading scores, uh, Brendan Ross and Eddie Moskowitz, 32 and 28 points. And Sawyer's got 19, right? Now, He's three years younger than both of those players, mind you. He's the best draft eligible one, but yeah, that's my guy. I, I really like the way he plays. He is a hard worker, kind of does everything right. Are your boys going to castrate you for saying that's my guy? Um, <laughs> In the context of the the Brooks Bandits, that's my guy. <laughs> I guess. Every, for every time you say that, it's another lashing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I made it clear that they're not allowed to find me. Some of them tried to, like, give me team fines last year. And I said, if I'm not allowed to find you guys, you guys aren't allowed to find me. If people listening don't know, like, team fines are, like, you know, team rules. Like, oh, you can't you can't wear your shoes into the dressing room. You, uh, whoever's on puck duty has to make sure as many pucks come back as go out. And, you know, team fines are always, like, a couple bucks. And then at the end of the week, you add up all the team fines, and then they go into, like, the fund for the team to buy Gatorade or – for a party or whatever um i i if, <laughs> they might try and find me for for that fun to buy gatorade yeah they somebody is on the hook to buy like the flats of gatorade for the bus damn i was gonna say i'm glad you said like for a party or something too because i was like if the fines are only going to gatorade this is depressing <laughs> Like, yeah, these are a bunch yeah. of young dudes. I hope they're having a good time. <laughs> oh, totally, totally. Silver oh. buckle and red deer. That's the, that's the spot for, for anybody in this town because that's the only bar really left. Unfortunately, 
Well, I can't wait to check it out. What, what do you think I'm going to think about it? It's a country bar, James. What do you think you're going to think of a country bar? I can do a Roxy Sunday, man. Like, like I do that. Yeah. Go to the Yale. Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 not that. Not that. Is there a bull? There's no bull. No. Oh, okay. All right. We're good. We're good. Uh, are you are you allowed entry without cowboy hat? I've never been there with a cowboy hat. Okay, cool. And it's yeah. and you're not a pariah for that? No, I'm not. Okay. No. All right. I got a chance then. I'll, I'll have a good time there. Yeah. I, I also don't have cowboy boots. That's not a prerequisite, is it? You don't have some shiny, bright red cowboy boots hiding in your closet, do you? Bright red? Is that a How I Met Your Mother reference? Bright that red is, of course, boots. a How I Met Your Mother reference. Yeah. Of course. Dude, That <laughs> that's so funny. Great show butchered by a terrible ending. Anyways, well, I don't know where we got so off track. I um, love the tangent, man. We haven't had one in a while. We've been too clean lately. We have been pretty we've been pretty consistent. Um what I will say though is this will end up being a, a especially lengthy podcast. And because of that, then <laughs> the tangents will feel <laughs> more exaggerated and more unnecessary. Um elite prospects throughout their first draft ranking. Do you remember when I went to that game and I watched Caden Lindstrom play and I was like in love with him? Yeah, and I yeah. was like, oh, the the fifteen to twenty five spot everybody has him in is way too low. He's going to go top ten. Somebody at Elite Prospects must like really, really agree with me because they have him at four. Maybe they listen to the pod. They have him at four, James. I doubt it, but they have him at four <laughs> overall. That's insane. That is like eleven spots higher than the highest I saw him before that. They also, interesting, uh, interestingly enough, Cole Iserman, who started this year with 18 goals in 12 games with the U.S. under-18 development team, third behind Ivan Demidov of SKA St. Petersburg and the Continental Hockey League. Another Russian stud is coming. We knew this guy was coming, right? We, we did. Um, he's hurt right now, so we haven't seen too much of him, but he can keep the puck on a string going a million miles an hour that's kind of his that's kind of his bread and butter is how fast he can move and how well he can stick handle while he's moving that fast um Macklin Celebrini is going to be consensus number one NCAA eight goals in seven games as a 2006 and that league is insane that's a crazy start um Sam Dickinson Berkeley Catton down the list a little bit the one I'm really, really interesting interested in to see how he develops as this year goes on is the guy that's currently at 13th overall in Elite Prospects' ranking. It's another Russian player playing in the KHL for uh, for Torpedo Nizhny Novgorod. Anton Selayev is his name. He is a left shot defenseman, 17 years old, six foot seven, 207 pounds. That's some lank. That's a lanky dude. And he his mobility is excellent for somebody that big. We talked about that with Dmitry Simashev last year. He's not as good of like a straight line skater as Simashev is, but he reminds me a lot of David Juracek. When he has a player coming at him, he can shut them down in so many ways. He doesn't rely on his backwards mobility and his, and his reach necessarily. He can engage them physically. His pivots are excellent his edge work is excellent when somebody's coming at him he's very very hard to beat one-on-one -on -one. um i think he ends up going way higher than anybody else is gonna think same thing with simashev you know you can't teach a six foot seven player with that who's that gifted on his feet right it's 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 one of those things that hard work is not gonna make you six foot seven <laughs> and for him to be that good of a skater at that size, I, I would be shocked if he doesn't go in the top 10. But we'll see. Okay, hear me out. Hear me out. Say the Coyotes draft him to build a decor with Salayev, who's six foot seven, right handed Maverick Lamoureux, who is six foot seven. He's a good player, Lamoureux. Yeah. And then Simashev, who's six foot four. Dursey playing with Simashev. Ooh, that's fun. That's it's kind really of a gross fun. top four. That's really fun. I mean, I hope Jersey sticks around, but he also could just like pile up points and then get paid a ton of money elsewhere. Wouldn't be shocked if that's 
what happens. <laughs> like that's a common move. Remember Taylor Hall tried to do that in Buffalo and it miserably failed. Yeah, yeah. And Hall, interestingly enough, ended up on the Coyotes when he was trying to do that. Wasn't that prior to? It was prior to. Oh, that is that what yeah, it was? Yeah. It was before, yeah. Backwards. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. It went Arizona, then Buffalo. Yeah. Okay. And ended up on the Coyotes and then tried to do that in Buffalo. I yeah. See. yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Thank you. I appreciate the quick dunk. Keep me on my toes. <laughs> Well, is there anything else you have for junior? Were there any other surprises in the in the in those rankings? No, everything's pretty status quo so far. Um, Do you have any goalies up high? Uh usually it's a no. It, usually it's a no. It Once in a while, is. they get you. Well, the last one was a scare off, right? And um, before that, Spencer Knight. Wallstead too was in that group. Yeah. Wallstead's going to be a stud, man. He's going to be so good. But yeah, we prospects didn't have any goalies until twenty six. Ooh, who's, who's Ryerson Lindiers. I have not seen much of him. 26 okay. in the OHL. We'll keep an eye on Mr. Ryerson. Michael Misa, who's the 2025 number one overall pick, has an older brother named Luke who has started so well for Mississauga in the OHL. 23 points in 15 games. Um, He's leading that team in points. Elite Prospects has him at 20. Um, but we have another, we have another brother duo and with the Hughes brothers taking over the league, right? I've actually got one more piece of junior talk. Yeah. I've got one more. Uh, Dalibor Dvorsky playing for the Sudbury Wolves right now. That's an excellent shout. Yeah. Uh, really, really nice play the other night. It ended up all over highlight reels. St. Louis Blues first rounder, uh, very much a part of their transition to the future. Seven points in his first six games in North America. I like to see it. I really like to see it. The guy is well, talented, physical, well rounded, six foot one, two hundred pounds. Like he's bulked up since he was drafted already. Like he's put on size in the offseason. I like it. I like it a lot. So what happened to Dalibor Dvorsky this year? Last season he split his time between the Swedish Junior League, the U twenties, and the All Svenskin, which is their tier two league. That's SHL two. Um, played 10 games with the U-20s, played 38 games in Tier 2 Men's Pro. He made the jump to the SHL this year. No points in 10 games, James. I really do not believe that was a testament of his um, of his, his play. It's a tough league, man. James, he played his last two games in the SHL. This is his time on ice. One minute and 35 seconds. And 44 seconds. He had one shift in his last SHL game. And then he got sat on the bench. 44 seconds. Wow, that must have been a lot of fun. Yeah. So I am very happy that he made the jump to Sudbury for his sake. At least he had good seats for that game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, I, I just, that's terrible for him to have to back-to-back games, two days apart, minute 35, 44 seconds. He never played more than his highest ice time was 15 22. Um, and that was the anomaly. That was the only one over 15 minutes. Um, most of them were sub 12, a couple nines. So it's good that he's made that jump. It's good that he looks good in that Sudbury team. We'll see him play for Slovakia, the World Juniors this year, and I think he will. He'll excel. He's already played in two World Junior tournaments. And um, yeah, I think he'll be he'll be a stud this year. Awesome. Well, uh, I think I think we move on to questions before we do games. I, th- I think we go that route. Okay. Um, I have five here. I think I know which one I want to knock out first. Okay. Yeah. Best player to never make it to the Hall of Fame. I've got two that are kind of neck and neck for me. We've talked a lot about Alexander McGillney. Yeah, talk- and that's the first one that comes to mind for me, and that's why I'm not using him. He was the other one. I'm going Alex Kovalev. Alex Kovalev. One of the most raw, talented players to ever play the game. Wow. You're absolutely right about his skill level. Did he have the career to justify that? I mean, a lot of guys have made the Hall of Fame the last few years. Yeah. And he does have a Stanley Cup with the 94 Rangers. Yeah, that is true. Career year was... That's more than a lot of guys have. 
Yeah, career year was 2000-2001, 44-51-95 with Pittsburgh. Yeah. Yeah, I remember him most as a Montreal Canadian. My uncle has a Kovalev jersey. He's a huge Habs fan. So Uh, 1,000 points, Stanley Cup, known for ridiculous raw talent around the league. And if you listen to a lot of player interviews from his era, most of them will say he was the most talented player they ever played with. I could get behind that. I definitely could. It's not the worst case. No, Alexander McGillney, like, Again, the fact he's not in there is still just a farce. Like, it's hard not to say him. There's clearly got to be some beef there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's ridiculous, man. I, it's hard to speculate, right? But do you have yeah. one that's not McGillney? Um, I have a bunch of guys that I think in my head, and like I know Jeremy Roenick. Is, he came to mind for me as well. Yeah, yeah, like. Excellent player, fifty goal score, thousand points. He he would you know, and I think part of the McGillney thing is is the fact he was a trailblazer for European hockey, right? And the Soviets coming to North America. Jeremy Roenick was a superstar American player at a time where superstar American players were quite frankly kind of few and far between, right? And and as much as I don't like including somebody in the Hall of Fame just because they played for a country that didn't have anybody else. You can't say that Jeremy Roenick's influence on American hockey wasn't significant. Yeah, I mean, there's there's quite a few you got to think of, but honestly, like like we, I think we kind of hit the nail on the head with the few we named. Um, but then there's going to be a lot of guys coming up uh, in the next next decade. We're going to get Thornton probably uh, quick when he retires. We're going to get eventually the uh, Crosby and Ovi. Like we have a lot of guys who are going to make it. Um, and then I feel like we're going to end up with Claude Giroux probably stuck in the the um, in that Ronick territory where he was never one of the top, top, top echelon players of his generation, but he was always right there. He's always right there, one tier below them. And he's going to end his career with over 1,000 points. Unfortunately, no cup, no individual hardware. Can't really get much further than that. Well, and Giroux's far from done. Right. That's kind of the thing I think with him is is True. he could still be part of this Ottawa Senators team in a significant way. You ever watch the show Entourage? No, but I've heard good things. See, I I haven't seen it either. I've always heard great things. I've always wanted to watch it. It's never been on any streaming services I have. Um, but apparently the thing Giroux's doing right now for all the young guys on the Sens is getting them to watch Entourage with him. That's their thing is he he makes them watch Entourage with him. That's really funny. <laughs> yeah. 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 I heard that one when I was listening to Scotty Upshaw and Shane O'Brien's podcast, Miss and Curfew. And I was just like, that is that is so cool. That is such like an inside source thing you'd have to hear from X players. <laughs> like, you're not gonna hear that anywhere else. Yeah, like who's who's reporting that? Well, I mean, let's I'm going to go through a really weird order in these questions because we have a handful. Aiden, what is your worst hockey take? You've got a lot of sizzling takes. What is your worst take? My worst take was that Vancouver should have picked Cody Glass over Elias Pettersson in 2017. I wanted them to take Glass. Um, Now, James, this was texted to me. That was an abridged version of the question. So I have to, you can give your worst hockey take, but I think the question was, what is the worst hockey take you've seen? Um, like somebody texted me that question, and I just wrote "worst hockey take" on the rundown. Um. Okay. The uh, I'll I'll answer it the way it was asked. Uh, the worst hockey take that I've seen, um, was probably this year when I saw a couple of those uh like Instagram fan pages rank Connor Bedard as the fourth best center in the NHL. That's valid. Like the kid is going to be there, but come on, let's just let's just back it up a bit. Fourth best center in the NHL. That is was, nuts. Is Dry Side a center on that list? When he wants to be. Yeah, because like having Bedard right now over McKinnon, Matthews, Point. David, Dry Hughes, Braden Point. Point. Any of those guys. Yeah, well, okay. I'm just saying like the egregious ones, right? You're right. Rupe Hans right now is above Connor Bedard. Matthews. I said Matthews. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, like that's bad, bad. 
Crosby, having him over Crosby, having him, Malkin. Yeah, having him over hints like, okay, yeah, you're wrong, but it's not terrible. Having him over like Patterson or Point or or you know what I mean? That's bad, bad. Dude, you um, can't even say top ten. It's not allowed. Okay, so what is your personal worst hockey take? And then I will go to my what's the worst take I've seen. Oh, my personal worst hockey take. Um, yeah. hmm. I'm really stubborn and I always think I'm right. So that's not a take. That's just a personality. No, no, trait. no, no, no. no. I, that, that's kind of my precursor. <laughs> as in, I'm okay, having a hard time. Okay. I'm having a hard time finding my <laughs> my worst yeah. take. There's just too many of the choose from. That's what you say. Um, I mean. Yesterday, because I have Jesper Bratt in my fantasy pool, as we've talked about many times, uh, and my buddy has Jordan Biddington as one of his goalies, I was like, oh, you're going to start Biddington? Yeah, he's going to get absolutely toasted by Jesper Bratt. That's going to suck for you. You're going to you're gonna come up with negative points. Uh, Biddington ends up carrying the team to a 4-1 win. So that's a, that's a recent one. But actual take, like an opinion? Um, okay, no, you know what? No, I have it. I have it. But it's not one that I have now. It's one that I had in my early days. Well, that was kind of my glass one too, right? It was very yeah. much at the time I was upset they didn't take him because I was a big Cody Glass fan. Remember when it was like probably around like 2012 to 2014? No, maybe like 2010 to 2013 ish, maybe in that area. It was like kind of cool to not like Crosby. Like, um, there, I remember there were, there were there were there was a there was a divide. I'm not gonna say it was cool to not like Crosby, but there was a divide where a lot of people just didn't like him because he was the only people only person in hockey anyone talked about, and I was among those. And I remember when those uh, hockey news articles would come out, and it would be like Taves or Crosby who's number one, and then I would be like, I don't even have him in my top three, <laughs> and here I am at like. 14 like no like 12 13 maybe 14 years old i was an idiot i was like datsuk number one and then like i i went like three or four down the list i was i was being stupid i was being really stupid and ignorant and i will admit that that was probably my worst hockey take ever on the taves crosby thing i always kind of thought taves should captain canada because i thought he was a better captain Mm. Um, not that that's like a terrible take to think he's a better captain, but it's more just like, are you really gonna piss off Crosby right before the tournament? No, you're not. Taves can Taves can take the A. <laughs> he's not. That's not going to affect his play. <laughs> um, and yeah, I guess 2014, I would have been what 11 years old. Maybe I don't get that nuance, but yeah. Um. All right. Well, wh- uh, moving on. What is your pettiest of pet peeves? You got any gnarly pet peeves? I've you got know what's so many. I have a lot of pet peeves. If you had to, the question again, this was another one. Somebody texted me. Um, The pettiest pet peeve I have, James, is one I hear a lot. (laughs) It's when people say ATM machine. It's not an ATM machine. It, and the M in ATM is the word machine. Okay. What about when they say AM in the morning? That's also at 8 AM in the morning. You know what? That's bad. I don't know if it's just the I, I I haven't heard that very much. That would also bug me. Saying that you're get stopping at an ATM machine is the same thing as like saying OMG my god out loud. That's terrible. I hate oh. it. Um Okay, I've got three. Okay, we're looking for petty ones like that. Cause I obviously have like real pet peeves that aren't about <laughs> ATMs. Okay, I've got three. Like, okay. Okay, number uh, number one, I just can't stand people messing with the temperature in my car while I'm driving. This is, I am the one driving. You want a different temperature, you could have drove. Like, like I, I'm going to drive at a comfortable temperature for me. I don't want to hear it, and I don't want you changing it. Just don't mess with it. Just leave it alone, please. Please, please, please. Um, and like it's as much of a pet peeve as me being ridiculously OCD about certain things. Okay, um, that's fair. Number two, uh, people texting lol too much. Like when every other message, there's <laughs> lol. 
it's like, oh, did you actually laugh out loud? Did you send that and go, ha, 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 ha? No, no, you didn't. You didn't. Plain and simple, you didn't. Why are you saying you did? <laughs> are, are, you, are you a liar? I guess you're lying. That's cool. <laughs> awesome. That's a great one. <laughs> I know. You know what? Do you know what the best part of you saying that is, James? Uh, you texted me lol three times today. Um, have I? Because I bet you I, I did. I think so. I think so. Um, you won't overdo it. There's I, the people I'm talking about are like every. Yeah. Message. No. 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 I. I. <laughs> I know for a fact there is going to be somebody I know very well listening to this podcast that does that and he's going to know who he is while I'm talking about him. Um, it's So you saying that is just very funny because I can picture the friend of mine that does that and I, I even think like I've pointed it out to him before. <laughs> um, that's, that's Okay, you said there were three. Yeah. <laughs> And then my third one, my third one, my biggest one is when um, it's a combination. It's like, and this isn't any specific one of my friends because everyone I know does it at times. It's just like um, when you want people to go do something fun with you and then they start coming up with excuses about things that are irrelevant. They're like, oh, I have no money. And then you like see on their story that they like ordered like a $45 Cactus Club DoorDash meal. And, okay. then, and then they like and then they like went shopping with their girlfriend and and bought like a ridiculous amount of clothing and it's like dude you could have came to this 45 dollar concert and then had a drink and then taken a cab home that would not have been a difference okay you are absolutely unequivocally irrefutably correct about that i passionately agree with you I don't think that's a petty pet peeve. I think that's just like a, I want my friend to respect me, <laughs> which is completely valid, right? The, the 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 car temperature one and the LOL one, those are petty pet peeves. The third one, I actually like, I just think that's like being a decent friend is don't make up stupid excuses. Tell me to my face that you don't want to do this with me, right? Like, oh, okay. I got one more petty pet peeve, an actual proper one. Okay. Have you ever had any friends that like you can very clearly tell they were a little sibling because they make noises like when they're bored because they're used to being the little sibling who doesn't have attention. So they're just like, they're just making noise all the time. I can't stand when people are just making noise all the time, like tap, tap, tapping on something or like clicking their tongue all the time. Like, like it's just like the most odd, odd thing. That one gets me going. I don't like that one. I have some sympathy because I think that's an ADHD thing. Uh, in a lot of cases, it is. And, and in which case, you're like usually pretty aware of of, of people uh, having a lot of mannerisms and tendencies and when it is a habit, whereas a lot of the time it's just like, hey, I'm looking at you. Hi. Hey, I'm over here. Hi. Is this multiple people? Or are you just like taking a shot at one specific? Oh, no, no. This is like, people throughout my entire life okay because i can't say that i've noticed people regularly in my life doing this and you know what maybe maybe that's because it's me <laughs> you have siblings i have a younger sibling but she was never really that hmm. yeah it was first noticed by me uh with my younger stepbrother when i was growing up and he was five years younger than me I'd be sitting there playing Xbox and he's just like looking at me and like tapping, tap, tap, tap. I'm like, hey, can you stop that? And then he just goes. Yeah, yeah. It's just not a problem I face. Yeah, yeah. I empathize. I empathize with the pain. I just can't relate directly. <laughs> you know, maybe now that I've pointed it out, you're going to get the glass shattering effect also from How I Met Your Mother, where someone points out things that others do. And now you're not going to be able to not notice it. I think what's more likely is I'm going to see you next weekend and just sit behind you and click my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you sit behind me and click your tongue, you're going to get like the heel straight to the nuts for sure. For sure. Just a, a backhand slap blind. No, no, the, the slap is too much of a public degradation. Like the, the heel straight to the nuts or or like a quick dead leg, like right on the thigh. That That's more like, okay, you need to stop. 
but also I'm a pretty peaceful person. So anyone who knows me knows I would never take it any further than that. So just catch me and James fighting on the street <laughs> next weekend because I wouldn't stop clicking in his ear at a country bar. We're not going to a country bar in Vancouver. Man. We are not going to a country no. bar in Vancouver. When you there come we... here, because when you come here, we don't have a choice, right? Yeah, true. When we There's have the option, nothing else. There's nothing else. Well, there is it. The there is there is. I haven't explored enough, right? Well, there is, but it's like forty-seven-year-old dudes like sitting at a bar stool quietly, like looking at the table and not speaking to each other in a dark, dim, dusty bar. Not quite, but yes. <laughs> Being from Port Alberni, there's a couple of those. Yeah, again, I haven't... Well, and you know what? Like, since I've been here, just the nature of my life being very work-heavy and then the person Caitlin is, it's just I haven't done that much, right? So you being here will get me out, and I'm sure we will go to a place that I've never gone before just because you're here. Oh, I'm contagious. Yeah, I, I I, am excellent at making my friends make bad decisions in a good way, like in a fun way. Like, you're not going to ruin your life. You're just going to do a bunch of dumb stuff. It just might ruin your day the next day. <laughs> oh, yeah, your next day is a complete write-off. I am a firm believer in that Sundays are supposed to be a write-off, and you are supposed to stay at home and watch movies and order in food and just sit on the couch. I think that is my day tomorrow. We're recording this on a Saturday night. I I do not, I do not think I'm gonna do much tomorrow. It is my only day off because I worked, save for the hour we did the podcast. I worked basically from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. tonight. I will work from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Monday. Um, so I will be very content to do absolutely nothing on Sunday. Sorry, I'm a little distracted. I'm watching my cat Marvin chew on his toes right now. He was like cleaning them and now he's just chewing on them. I, I don't know. If I, I kind of ended up with a really dumb cat. Like he's not a genius. He's not like he's not all there, but I love him. He's great. But yeah, all right, moving on. Um, Aiden and I talked about this briefly before we hit the record button again. Uh, someone said uh, we've talked about YouTube. Is there a possibility of a video podcast? Aiden, fill him in. What did we arrive at? Okay, so. Um, my Wi-Fi in this townhouse on campus is abhorrent. It's it's usable in terms of like I can watch YouTube and the Xbox works fine and and we have no problems with Netflix yada yada yada, but my office upstairs where I have my desk and everything set up, I I basically had to stop recording up here with James because the Wi-Fi was so bad. So for a big chunk of time, I'm not joking. I would record the podcast sitting on the floor in front of my TV because that's where the router was because that was the best, like we don't have any technical difficulties way to do it. Um, I bought a, and again, I'm not joking, 100 foot ethernet cord for me to run from my office upstairs down my stairs so that I could do the podcast in my office because it's where I had my new microphone set up and I didn't have to take over the house <laughs> that Caitlin also lives in to do the podcast once a week. Um so that will make it now a possibility because I can actually like have more than four pixels showing my face on a camera, which is all that the Wi-Fi would lend itself before. So it is real. Um, again, that YouTube page has a pretty strong subscriber base to start with. Um, we have some pretty intriguing guests. I think our first video podcast, James, should be one of those guests. I don't want to drop the name yet because it's still not for sure. Um, but we have some cool guests, hopefully in the works for Christmas for world junior season. I would love to debut the video for something like that. So it is hopefully coming. Um, throw me a text or message the Instagram or the Spotify. If you passionately want to see that. <laughs> I mean, on top of that, there's the possibility that when I visit, maybe we could do a couch cast. We just got to get a couple lights in there. We could have a video couch cast. We could go live on our Instagram for a brief one while, while watching hockey or something even. This office actually would lend itself kind of nicely to that because I have a couch behind me. Perfect. And That's like, lovely. This microphone perfectly would be right next to where one of us would sit. Um, yeah, dude. So this hear is... me out. When I visit, before we go for a little outing, 
we we throw on an NHL game and do some live commentary and uh and and uh have a nice little pregame before we go have ourselves a bit of a night and we do a couch cast just a brief one that's far from a bad idea yeah far from a bad idea i'll take that i'll take that rebuttal that's that's nice i like that <laughs> well okay uh we have one last question uh career aspirations for you and i um you know i'm going to kind of uh, add a little layer to this this could be um goals of events you want to cover uh pieces of content you want to make um places you would like to work um anything of the kind give me something if we're talking the most ambitious high flying lucrative just <laughs> unobtainable <laughs> of the goals i would love my name to be in a conversation where you're talking about Oh, favorite NHL broadcasters, right? The same way I talk about Gordon Miller, Chris Cuthbert, the same way people before would have talked about Bob Cole, Jim Hewson. That's that would be it, right? Um, I would love to work for an NHL team, do play by play. I would absolutely love to go cover the World Juniors. I would love to be the not Gordon Miller commentator and just do like Group B and two of the quarterfinals. That'd be super cool. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I. I work really hard at it, right? And and I I'd love that to be rewarded in that way. I in terms of like being a play by play broadcaster, I put I put so much into it, right? The the amount of prep work I do before games to be fully prepared, the the fact that there are times where I'm just listening to broadcasters do games to just to to hear them do it, right? It's the broadcaster version of watching game tape of somebody you want to play like, right? Like um, I'll listen to my own games to see where I can get better. I put a lot into it and I, I would love, I'd love to be able to move up. Definitely. Great maneuver. Um, for me personally, um, career aspirations, I'd like to, um, like, uh, I mean, I don't know what, if people know how much, what people know about what I do, but, um, I write for a, somewhat major news outlet in a digital like web role um i'd like to be like a more multifunctional kind of journalist in the future like a little bit of tv a little bit of radio a little bit of web um be able to play my hand at everything um i'd like to be more reporter style in the sports aspect i feel like that'd be a lot of fun being able to just um i mean in a way i already can but uh just be primarily doing that i think that would be a lot of fun to um kind of do it the way some of the athletic senior reporters do it uh, i was gonna say yeah like do you want to be a team's beat reporter would that be something that would be up your alley oh i would have a ton of fun with that i would have a great time but also i don't really like just reporting on one thing that's never appealed to me like the idea of, of just following or covering or or sticking to one specific team or one specific idea or topic like that that doesn't appeal to me as much i'd like to be more overarching but you know find your spot and you're probably gonna have fun with it so th that's a big thing and also i've um renewed interest in a realization i had as a small child and also remembered probably about eight months ago i want to write a book that's awesome i've always been kind of like half that's always half been in the back of my mind too you know what you know what's in my mind and i think you're gonna jump on this i'd love to write a movie oh totally i mean i i more i more uh would be interested in writing like a tv screenplay like 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 doing like a season of a tv show i feel like that's like a really fun way to flesh out a character arc i think that's a lot of fun you have a lot more time to play with it and time to get a character where you you want it to get like you look at some of your favorite directors like you look at a scorsese christopher nolan like they're able to they're able to get a character's story done start to finish for you in two hours two and a half hours like for the average person it's going to take a lot longer than that it's not easy um but yeah a book um i would be a novel um probably fiction it would definitely be fiction maybe based somewhat on a true story um i've always liked the like coming of age type thing 
like uh someone finding themselves lost and finding a way way through the storm like that kind of that kind of idea um i've always just played around with ideas there and um yeah i've kind of renewed interest in that recently because i rewatched rewatched a couple movies and shows that made me feel like that in the past but when the idea first came to me i was 7 years old and my hamster es- uh, escaped through a drain in my grandparents basement and um i my mom and i had this great idea that we would write a kids book about the hamster's adventures in the forest after it it like in the forest and making its way through town after it escaped how it just goes on this grand adventure and it's just it's a hamster but now that's not the idea i want to go for it would be it would be a person obviously but yeah yeah that, that was where the idea originally came from where do hamsters come from? They don't they don't like live in the wild, do they? Dude, I have no idea. I've never been asked that. Like guinea pigs too? Are, yeah, gerbils. Are, yeah. Are, are guinea pigs from Papua New Guinea? Like, is that a thing? That's a good question. These are the things I wonder about. That was the first thing I thought when you said hamster, and then like in the woods, I was like, what is a hamster's quote natural habitat? That was where my mind went. You know, really random thing, but I was talking to a girl on a dating app recently, and she said she had nine guinea pigs. I'm calling red flag. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what nine guinea pigs means. Like, how do you even get nine guinea pigs? Where do you find that many? Like, like, is there a like guinea pig delivery service? Do you like subscribe? Do they do they show up monthly in the mail? Like, are you are you going and hitting every different store to find different breeds of guinea pigs? Like. What do you do with nine guinea pigs even? Like, where do you put them? Are they just, aren't they just squeaking and squealing all the time? Like, they're not free running around your place because they poop all the time. No, no, they're like in like a enclosure of some sort. It's not like a small How cage. How big of an enclosure do you need for nine guinea pigs? And a lot. Are they in separate enclosures? I don't know. I have a friend who has, I think, two. And they're in one enclosure together. But that mm. is two and not nine. <laughs> what do you do with nine? I just want to know, like, was it one trip to a pet store and you saw a couple and you just like went to the front? We're like, I want your guinea pigs thinking there was like two. And then they just dropped a box of nine and you were too embarrassed to say that you only meant two. Like, again, or or is it you like go to you get like one a month for a while? Yeah, it's a subscription service. It's like subscribing to Lego magazine when you're a kid, except a different guinea pig shows up at your door every month. Okay, let's move on. (laughs) Okay, we got uh three more questions. No, 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 no. We We're can saving those. We can save those. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Just in case we get none. Just in case we get skunked for the next one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> After we called out our new listeners to say hey. <laughs> okay. Well, all right. Uh, a couple games to play. Do you have any trivia for me? I've got. Uh, I've got one career trajectory for you. Yeah, give it to me. Okay, so. Aiden, I have your player, and this one is going to be a really odd one. I don't know how you're going to do. I don't know if you're going to get it. The player is of some significance to me, and I have talked about this player once before. That is, I'm going to give you that hint in advance. Um, Okay, this player's career went from 2006 to 2013, and it went Anaheim Ducks, Pittsburgh Penguins, Chicago Blackhawks, Toronto Maple Leafs, Carolina Hurricanes. I honestly don't know if you ever get this one. But you also might get it right away. And if I I have a stupid hint that isn't going to help you at all. And then I also have a hint that will help a lot for once we get real close. You saying you mentioned this guy is messing with my head. Because that's the part I'm now like focusing on. And I just don't know. Would you like the hint? I'll start with the, the, the not super helpful one. Sure. This player was in a youtube video that was on my tv that um 
before we hit record on the pod once it was playing. I have nothing to say to that. <laughs> okay, do you want the better one? Yeah, like I... That, uh, was the, that was the most pointless thing you could have said. This player has a notable career highlight where we saw something extremely painful happen to them. This extremely painful thing didn't result in a notable injury, but when watching it, you go, oh, ow, that would hurt. I know it's not Yoni Pitkinen, but now that's all that's stuck in my head because he had his no, it's not career that. ended early because of injury, but he was good too. That was sad. Very solid player. I have the link to the video uh, ready in our Zoom chat for when you actually give up. I've just sent Aiden a link to the exact moment and player that I'm talking about that was in the YouTube video. And that moment is one Mr. Tim Brent blocking three shots on a five-on-three PK for the Maple Leafs in 2011. Tim Brent is the player. There was no way that was going to happen. You would never have got that? No. Really? No. I felt like the Maple Leafs Hurricanes at the end would have would have maybe got you. Yeah, that would... But trying to think of somebody who played for the, the previous three teams was definitely a curveball, right? Toronto, oh, Carolina. Totally. I was thinking like John Michael Lyles for a second. I was thinking... I was thinking a bunch of guys that definitely did that, but... Yeah, that, yeah. Okay. Fun fact about Tim Brent, he was drafted by the Mighty Ducks twice. In 2002, 37th overall, and in 2003, 75th overall. Or sorry, 2004, 75th overall. That's, That's a wild. Fun fact. It's a nice nugget for you. Well, okay. Closing the page on Tim Brent, do you have any trivia for me? I, I, there's no way I can top that. <laughs> I just want to, I, I just want to be mad at you. Because I just opened his DB page. Anaheim, Pittsburgh, Chicago, Toronto, Carolina. This guy played one game for Pittsburgh and two (laughs) games for Chicago. Come on. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that was never going to go well for you. I had this one handpicked a long time ago. (laughs) Uh, and I, I found him in a hockey DB rabbit hole, just clicking on teams and clicking on players and then clicking on teams they played for and clicking on rosters from that year. And I was like, oh, Tim Brent, haven't thought about him in a while. <laughs> okay, well, moving on. Are there any great movies you watch in the past uh, since we watched since we did the last pod? I've got a bucket full of them, but I'm going to pick just one. I watched Killers of the Flower Moon last night. Give me your spoiler-free review. Let's hear it. Spoiler-free review? For a movie about something that happened between 1918 and 1934 or something, those dates, those years are wrong, but that's a general time frame. It felt kind of, it felt pretty relevant Um, just because the whole thing centers around greed, right? And disregard for human life and comfort in pursuit of that greed and that wealth and um that's just kind of how i personally my personal political uh personal political opinions that's how i view just society especially north american society is disregard for people in pursuit of wealth and greed so watching that kind of hit that what everybody's subjected to now that's not to discount from the very, very real, very, very heinous things that these real people went through because that is so, so beyond what beyond what anybody should have ever had to go through. Um, I thought the movie was very well acted, very well written, very well paced. It never really felt like it dragged for the fact it was over 200 minutes long. Um, I will, yep, yeah, 8.75 out of 10. Damn, that's that's high praise. I like it. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. Um, okay, I watched Shutter Island for the first time. 
No kidding. Martin Scorsese, one of his best. That's a superb movie. How'd you like it? Um, I still can't tell what happened at the end. I don't know which one of the two scenarios is true for the ending. And I know which one is canonically true, and I know which one is likely, but I still feel like I'm getting messed with. That movie bended my mind, and I was just so stuck and confused. And I was sitting there with one of my friends that I watched a lot of movies with, and it was his third time watching it. And uh, he said he understands how it actually ended, but like watching it the third time, it was the best watch he'd ever had of it. Oh man, yeah, yeah that that movie that movie tore me a new one. I I was just so stuck. I I couldn't figure it out. My mind hole was gaping. Like, there's a lot of reveals in that. Mm-hmm. Did any of those more significant ones like really shake you, or did you half see some of them coming? I honestly like like part of it. I was I kind of felt like it was looping together. Like there was more to it than what he thought was going on i felt like that all along i felt like there was more to his own adventure that that than what leo's character thought was going on but no i didn't i didn't see any of it coming and i didn't understand what it was when it was happening because i thought he was just having more dreams it was was wild it was absolutely wild it was one of the craziest movies i've ever seen like absolutely mind-bending it in certain portions what's your out of 10 Okay, so I always have to precursor how I rate things. 10 is an unattainable, unimaginable thing that we all strive for, but it's it's not possible. Like, zero is, like, so bad it doesn't exist. Like, it's not a thing. And, like, like to get a zero, like, I recently watched Surfer Dude starring Matthew McConaughey. That got a 0.1. That is That is the worst movie I've ever seen. Surfer, comma, dude, starring Matthew McConaughey is the worst movie I've ever seen. Um, I've never seen that, nor have I heard of it. You'll never get that hour and 28 minutes or whatever it is back. You never will. Is there anything redeemable about it? Like, is it comically bad or is it just bad? There's good looking people in it. Okay, that's not anything redeemable in a movie to me. Um, There's, I think I laughed once. I, I I laughed once. That was cool, but yeah, Shutter Island. I don't know, probably like a like a high sevens, low eights, and that's pretty high for me. Yeah, you are. I feel like that's my high eight, low nine. <laughs> yeah, like I'm a really tough marker. Yeah. So yeah, I'd say I'd say that's where I stand on it. Um. Yeah, yeah, I I moved my way through a couple other things. I recently rewatched Perks of Being a Wallflower. Just incredible flick, just that's, incredible flick. That's I, I did that movie. last night. That was my late night on the couch by myself movie. Excellent. That is an excellent movie. That is very good. Yeah, and then I did a little bit of research, and it never got any uh, Oscar consideration because uh, the Academy doesn't uh, consider things about youth very much they consider stories about youth to be borderline irrelevant, apparently, according to a Reddit rabbit hole I got myself into. Interesting. Yeah. You saying that now I can think and think, oh, yeah, like, you don't see those kinds of things considered much. Boyhood was an Oscar darling. Yeah. Um, That's the only one I can really think of. You know what my one beef with the perks of being a wallflower is? What? How they hear Heroes by David Bowie on the radio and then they like don't know what the song is. Like, who the hell? Are, how do you not know Heroes by David Bowie? Are you kidding me? Come on. Don't put your hand up, James. Now, David Bowie is probably my favorite artist of all time. Okay, so yeah. That is, right. That's the position I'm coming at it from. But like when at the end when they're like, oh my God, we found the song. I was like, it's <laughs> how... How 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 did you just now find this song? It's Bowie, man. Like, come on. <laughs> I was I was <laughs> that didn't it, it didn't bug me enough to like discount the movie going experience, but it it 
<laughs> it definitely hit a nerve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see. I didn't even. I didn't even clue into that part. It was an awesome song. I didn't really know it. I'd heard it before, but I didn't know it. I love it. But yeah. Um. So we've had a lot of fun with this pod, but unfortunately, we do have to. We have to talk about something pretty tragic that happened in the hockey world and i imagine most of if not everyone listening to this pod right now knows what we're talking about and that is the death a very unfortunate and tragic death of adam johnson in uh over in the uk um a tragic fatal incident with uh escape blade and his neck um honestly i don't even really know what to say i I I refuse to watch the video. I I urge people not to watch the video. From what has been described to me, it is pretty gruesome from certain views. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a pretty terrible thing, and it's been pretty felt through all of the hockey world. Aiden, do you want to kind of take it away here? It's hard to say anything else other than just how sad it is, and you know, when something like this happens, it it kind of reaffirms to me how reactionary the sport is. And it bugs me a little bit because realistically something like neck protection, it probably should be there. Probably should have been there before. I really don't see a reason why it couldn't have existed already. And the fact that we're now seeing, you know, like in the NHL, the Pittsburgh Penguins organization mandated it for their AHL and ECHL players to have neck protection. The WHL has mandated it. The CGHL has mandated it. But it really, really hurts that somebody had to pass away for these safety measures to be put in place. The possibility of this happening was always there. And it, it's it's harrowing to think that he could still have his life if, if these precautions were in place. I think they should have been. And it, it it's sad, right? And, you know, it gets you to start thinking. Like, I, I, I think... I think guards on the wrists as well right like it's such a dangerous sport i i i understand so much of it is you know you're you're signing up for the risk but there also could be precautions that are taken that could save somebody's life and i think i think the fact that they're only taking them after something tragic has happened that, that's great for everybody else but adam johnson adam johnson's gone and it's terrible and it's 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 so sad that he passed away so unnecessarily just because there was i think a lack of a lack of sufficient neck protection in hockey it baffles me that it wasn't already mandated and it's it's so 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 upsetting that he had to pass away for it to be now starting to be implemented and yeah it's it's yeah it it, it, i'm gutted right like it's terrible to see and yeah yeah um and i guess we can just give condolences to his friends and family and hope that something like this never happens again right this is uh really all we can hope for is that uh this is kind of a wake-up call in hockey that was needed that this kind of protection is needed and um yeah i think on that note, I think we close this episode out. Unless there's anything else you want to add, Aiden. Don't watch. Don't watch the video. Don't watch the video. Yeah, don't, don't watch it. Just please don't watch it. Um, not that I've seen it, but just from reading the description of it, it's not not something you want to see. It's better left unseen. But yeah, I think uh, you know. Other than that, I think this was, this episode was a lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it um and we will see you in the next one so without further ado further ado not ladu i don't know who ladu is without further ladu let's roll that outro thanks guys (laughs)